welcome to our verse-by-verse -verse journey through Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. The Gospel of Matthew serves as a bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. In this Gospel, Matthew seeks to prove to the Jews that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. For those of us who aren't Jews, Matthew helps us to see our Savior King more clearly and through his gospel, learn to live well in his, in Christ's kingdom today. So grab a cup of coffee, open your Bible to the gospel of Matthew, and let's learn about our Savior King and his kingdom. Matthew chapter 10, Matthew 10. So I was blessed by how worship turned out as well. It wasn't, um, you know, what we normally have, but what we normally have isn't necessarily the only thing we have. So I was, I was very happy with how that turned out. There was a little, a uh, little, little last minute getting everything organized. So the fact that we pulled it off is a testimony to the fact that God is gracious and merciful and loving to us. Amen? Okay, we're going to continue our series through the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, uh, real quick, um, am I speaking to just humans here today? Just, you know, checking. You know, we're all humans here today. And, and as humans, we were created by God. That every last human who has ever lived, ever been conceived, was conceived, created by God regardless of the human instruments that were involved in that process. Now, God did that with his sovereign creative power. God is sovereign over the entire universe, and he creates things out of nothing, or he takes things that already exist and then uses them to create other things. And so God is infinitely creative. And so he created all of us, and he did it because he wanted to. And so the whole idea of a mistake, you know, people that are born by mistake or, or accident, you know, we, you know, we had a oops baby. Um, it wasn't an oops. It was absolutely ordained by God. And um, she has been a blessing to us. The other two were a little questionable on, no, I'm kidding. We love, I love all my kids. And he, God created us, created all humans, so that we would bear his image out into the world. And, and that he, he, that's for all humans, whether they're believers or not. That's what they're created for. That's their purpose, is to take his image out. Now, the way that we take God's image out, we, we bear his image out in the world, is by loving him, deliberately choosing to love God, and allowing him to love us. As we do that, his image is displayed for the whole world to see. We're created to be his children. Unfortunately, sin is real. Somebody say, ooh, ah, no, boo. Sin is real. And sin in the world separates us from God, separates us from his grace, separates us from his mercy, separates us from his love. And to fix that, God had a plan. God sent Jesus. He sent Jesus to make a way so that anyone who will believe can be redeemed out of that sin, out of the darkness, into the light, and be redeemed from our fallen state and return to an intimate communion fellowship with God so that we are able then to actually bear God's image out in the world because apart from Christ, we cannot bear God's image out. We bear an image of God, but not the correct image of God. Last week in our text, we saw... God's heart for humanity. I'm going to read this again uh, in chapter 9, verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, that's all the people that are around him, he was moved, he being Christ, was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. 
In today's message, we're going to see Jesus doing exactly that, sending laborers out into the harvest. So let's pray, and we'll ask God to, to minister our hearts because the, the main thought of this message is as Jesus sends his disciples out, he's sending them out to lost humanity. And, that, and what, it, what we should have a heart for is, is for the lost. We should have a heart for the lost, a heart of love, a heart of compassion, a heart of pity, a heart that, that desires them to know Christ with, with, with a burning passion within us. Now, all of us are going to be different in that. All of us are going to have a, a, a varying degree of that passion. But I believe it's something that God would have for all of us. So let's pray and ask God to do a work in our hearts. Heavenly Father, we do come and we thank you, Lord God, that, that, that we were once lost, but now we are found. And I'm guessing that everyone here um, is in the found category. I'm guessing that most people that are watching this live right now are also in that category. But if, if there is someone here who doesn't actually know Christ, there's someone here who has, uh, you, know, you know, maybe been, been uh, acting, you know, like a Christian, kind of showing up and doing those things that, Lord, their heart would be touched this morning to know that they, that they were created for something different, something better. And, but for all of us, Lord, I, got, I pray that you give us a, a deep abiding passion for you that manifests in a passion for those you created to be the objects of your love who don't know you yet. And so I pray, minister our hearts as we open up your word and we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. So this chapter begins with Jesus calling um, the 12. Um, we refer to them as the 12 regularly, the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles, 12 uh, closest companions of Christ, the ones that we will see interacting with him most intimately throughout the, the rest of the gospel. Um, they were first called disciples, but then they're called apostles in the same text. And so the, there's this, this this description, this idea that while there's, there's in one way synonymous but in another way, distinct. The, the reality is that, is that all believers are called to be disciples, and, and some disciples are called to be apostles. Some, all believers, all humanity is called to be believers, right? Recognize that God created humanity for the purpose of knowing him and loving him and glorifying him and, and carrying his image out. <clears throat> That's the reality of why we are created. We are created to bear God's image out. Once we become believers, God would call us, call us into a deeper relationship with him. And that relationship is disciple. A disciple, another word for disciple, is a learner. Someone who is determined to learn everything there is to know about God and his word. That's what a disciple is. A disciple in the time of Christ, these 12 were called to follow Jesus, literally follow him around place to place, learn everything they could about what he taught, about who he was, about all the things of God that he was relating. That's what, that's what a disciple was. An apostle is someone who is sent out. And so there is a distinct difference between believer, disciple, and apostle. All, it, all believers are called to be disciples. Not all believers become disciples. That's a reality of Christianity. Some disciples, but not all, are called to be apostles, are called to be sent. We use a different word for apostles in, in, the, in our vernacular, and that would be missionaries. Those who are called to take the gospel out to the lost in the world. Now, there are some who have a gifting of apostle, and that's a little bit different, but that's not really a topic. We're going to talk about this idea of what Jesus was calling these 12 to, and these 12 are unique. They're not, they, they, weren't, they weren't, you know, the, the first of a, a whole series of these. They were unique with the possible exception of a couple others that came a little bit later. But these ones were special. These ones were unique. These were, these were the 12 that Jesus called for a very particular, specific, and temporal work. Verse 1. 
We'll look at that. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, his 12, he called specifically and only 12 for this, this particular work. That, that's important to understand as well, that, that, that Jesus will decide who he wants to do what, right? Does not, does not God get to decide who does what in his kingdom? And, and we can desire something greater we can desire something, something exalted, something, you know, that's important. You know, the, 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 in, the, in the writings to, the, uh, to the, um, uh, the, the pastoral epistles at one point, Paul says, it is a noble thing for someone to desire to be a bishop or an elder. That's a noble thing. Doesn't mean you get to be one just because you want to be one. But it's, 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 it's okay to aspire to these things. But Jesus gets to decide who is who and what is what, right? He's God. Still God. He gave them power over unclean spirits to cast, out, cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. For Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Labaeus, whose surname is Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. <clears throat> we could take our whole time and talk about these 12 guys. There are some unique things. There's some comparisons there if you compare them, like Simon and Matthew. To put them in the same county could cause problems because they were so opposite one another. Their view, worldview, their philosophies of life, everything, they were hostile. The, the, the very nature of who they were was hostile toward one another. And so the fact that Jesus put them among his 12 and they hung out together for the next three years without killing each other is a, is a testimony of how God can take diverse people and bring them together for his glory and beautiful thing. He calls them and then he gives them power. Now that word power is interesting because there's two, two Greek words that are used that, that we translate into English. The first one is the word dunamis and it, it speaks of God's supernatural power. The, the power that takes nothing and makes something. You know, that, that does the, you know, the, you know it, it, was, it was Jesus' dunamis power that took the, you know, the loaves and the fishes and multiplied them. You know, so that, that's the miraculous power. When he calmed the sea, that's, that's a dunamis power. The another word is the word exousia, and it, is, it speaks of authority and the authority to do something. And it's interesting, too, because there's a lot of overlap between the two, because we're going to see in here that the, he, the word that's used here is the exousia. The authority is given to these, these 12, the authority over unclean spirits, meaning they could boss them around. But not only that, but they could heal what kind of diseases and sicknesses? All kinds. Jesus gives to them the same power that he was exercising. In essence, he gave them the same ability, the same power, the same authority to do the things that he was doing as a testimony of what their message was. One of the interesting things that we always come to when we see any, any description of the list of the 12 is Judas Iscariot. I mean, you almost can't, you can't read that list without wondering because it, it's, he's often described the way that he is here. Judas Iscariot, who would betray him? The betrayer. Like, like, and what we need to understand, never forget this. When Jesus told him, chose him, he knew what, what Judas was going to do. Jesus then gives them some instructions. Starting in verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but 
go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. You know, I can't help but wonder about Judas Iscariot because he's one of the 12. Jesus gives him the authority to cast out demons, to heal the lepers, to raise the dead. He sees all the miracles. He sees people getting saved by hundreds, maybe thousands of people getting saved. He spends three years with Jesus and experiences the love of God in a way very few humans ever have. And still, he betrays Jesus. Some people, no matter how much of God's grace they see and experience, will not bow a a knee to Jesus. If, if, If Judas could could commune and walk and talk and eat and, and do miracles with God in the flesh and not bow his knee to him? We got to know that there are people around us that won't bow their knee either. Shouldn't surprise us when somebody says, yeah, no, I don't need that. This is the, the first missionary journey that we see going on in the, in the Gospels. And Jesus tells them to concentrate their efforts on the people of Israel, the lost sheep of Israel. And that's interesting. He tells them to stay away from the Gentiles. A Gentile is anyone who's not a Jew. And the Samaritans were kind of a crossbreed. They were Jews and, they're Jew and Gentile intermixed. And so it was kind of a, a mixture, a mixed race kind of a thing going on. And he says, you know, don't, don't, don't stay out of them. Stay away from them. Just focus on the lost sheep of Israel. And it reminds us that, that, that God's plan was always to bring salvation to the whole world through the Jews. And so he's concentrating all of his efforts here. Almost all the ministry that Jesus did while he was here was to the Jews, though he did get out outside of Israel a little bit. Almost all of his ministry was to the Jews. And it was primarily because he was fulfilling God's promise to use the Jews to reach the rest of the world for, with salvation. So that was just a fulfillment of that. He would later, but when we get to the end of this, send them out to the whole world. And so there was a plan to reach the whole world, but it was to reach Israel first and then to go out. And then as he, to prove that their message was true, he gives them the power, the authority to do all these miracles. I'm going to read verse 8 again. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely you have received, freely give. One of the traits that ought to be obvious in the life of a believer is generosity. Larry touched on it everything, everything that exists is God's. Everything that exists, even those things that are mine. Anybody have anything that is mine? You know, in our hearts and minds, we all do. You can, you can say, no, no, not me, pastor. I've given it all to God. Yeah, sure you have. And we should, ultimately. But it is all his. He gave it to us. He gave everything to us. And everything he continues to give to us is his. And and much of it is for our pleasure, our enrichment, our growth, our whatever. But not all of it. Some of it he gave to us that isn't for us. It's for others. Or it might be for him to come back to him so that he can do something else somewhere else with someone else. And so what we what we have to wrestle with on a regular basis is that that the end of verse eight. Freely you have received. That means everything you got, God gave to you. You didn't don't you don't deserve it, but he gave it to you freely. What should you do with it? Enjoy it. Flourish with it. You know, you know, stock it away and 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 invest it. No. 
He says, freely give. There ought to be this heart of generosity within every believer that, that, that now again, don't give all your stuff away. That, that, that would be silly. But there, there is a portion of everything that God has given you that he gave to you to give away. And all of us are, 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 are exploring and discovering our relation with God. Part of that is understanding and discovering how much, what, God? What do I have that you gave to me for someone else? You know, I've got 50 pounds of grapes out on the counter out there because, you know, God gave them to me because, you know, I, I, I'm not going to eat them all. What should I do with them? Freeze them. Save them. No. Give them away. Give them away. Now, that's a, a simple thing. But what, what do we have as you're going through your life? And, and the way that we often answer that question is God brings a need before us. And so some need comes into our life, and you know, someone else's need comes into our life. And so this person needs, this person you know, has this, this, whatever it might be. We ought to have this heart, is what can I do? What role can I play? Now, now you, you're not always going to be able to, and that's okay. You're not always going to be able to give. But when you do have the opportunity, you need to ask and, and ask God to say, okay, is this one of those times where you have freely given and I need to freely give back. Generosity. It is a mark of a true God-seeking, Christ-following believer. Jesus then goes on to talk to them about how they should behave as they're traveling. Verse 9. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs, for a worker is worthy of his food. Now, whatever city or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy and stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. And if the household is worthy, let your peace be upon, come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. Now, there's an element where this idea of peace being upon it or return to you, an element where they were, they were enabled through this authority, this power, to bring some sort of a blessing upon the household that would, in fact, receive them and show them hospitality. Now, the culture that was going on at this time, there were rabbis traveling all around Israel regularly teaching in these towns. So they go to a town, they'd hang out, and the, the rule was you can't stay more than three days. If you stay more than three days, you're, you're a false prophet, and you need to, you know, they'll kick you out. Now, so the idea was was you come in, you teach from, you know, you know, from the, you know, about God and the word of God, and then you'd move on to the next town. These guys, that's how they made their living. They would go from town to town to town, and it was an accepted practice, and it was a good practice, with the exception of anytime there's a good thing, there is the, you know, you know, Satan will throw in the counterfeit, and there were always false prophets running around as well, and you had to be careful which ones you were dealing with. But the idea is you, you're saying to them, hey, just go into these towns and receive the hospitality that is normal and expected in that time and in that culture, where, they, where these, these itinerant preachers would come in, and someone in that town would say, hey, please come stay with me. And then that person would take care of them, would, would feed them, give them a place to stay. If they needed clothes, they would give them clothes. They would take care of them while they were there. And that Jesus is saying, do that. And the idea is, and the, and the sense of it is, part of what Jesus was trying to communicate to them to learn how to be utterly dependent upon God and his grace. You go do what I told you to do, and you trust that I will take care of you while you're doing it. Oh, that's a powerful lesson for us, isn't it? When, 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 we, when we, get a, a, we hear something from God, God says, I want you to go do that. I want you to do whatever it might be. And we think, well, wait a minute, God, I can't do that. How am I going to do that? What's, what happens if? You know, you know, I always love talking about the, about the what if stuff. Like, what if? I mean, like, if you're going to start playing the what if game, that game never ends, right? You can always think of reasons not to do something God says. But if God is telling you to do it, there is no reason not to do it. There is no if that God can't deal with and address on the way. God's looking for obedience, willing immediate obedience. When he calls, we go. Let 
You know, when, when someone comes to faith early on, they can be pretty zealous to share Christ. You know, many, many brand new believers, they get all, woohoo, love of Jesus. I love Jesus. You should love Jesus too. And they, you know, and they, and there's a sense there in them. This wasn't me, but the, you know, I, I've seen this where they get all excited and they want to go tell everybody about Jesus and what, and their expectation, man, if you know what I know, you're going to do what I did. Right? So I'll tell you what happened. I, I heard this. I got saved. Now you need to hear it and you'll get saved. But what happens? It doesn't happen like that. So Jesus prepares his disciples for the reality of sharing the gospel with others. Verse 14, and whoever will not receive you nor hear your words, when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. The reality is, is that if you, if you share Christ with someone, there's a chance they're, gonna, they're, they're not going to want to have anything to do with it. They don't want to know Jesus. They don't think they need Jesus. They, they're maybe even offended that you would even suggest that they need Jesus. I can remember that attitude very well because that was my attitude. I want you to think about something. The first disciples, apostles, Jesus said, go. And oh, by the way, I'm going to give you power to heal the sick to heal diseases, to cast out lepers, cast out demons, heal the lepers, one of the two, raise the dead, and while you're at it, share the gospel. And if someone rejects you, what? If someone rejects you, how is that even possible? But it was possible. He says to them, this is what you should do. Shake the dust from your feet. And, the, and that is a very cultural thing. When the Jews traveled, if they traveled to a Gentile area, meaning a non-Jewish area, or to a Samaritan area, and they came back into Israel, in the, into the land of Israel, they would, as soon as they entered the land, they would turn around, face the land they came from, and shake the dust off. Because in that other land, they were defiled by that land. They were corrupted by it. And so the, the symbolism by shaking the dust off is I am, I, am, I am shedding myself of the defilement and the corruption of that wrong place. And Jesus is saying to them, thinking very natural, very normal, very, very well-known cultural circumstance and applying it to Jewish cities. If, you, if they don't receive if they don't receive me, or they don't receive the, the gospel, the kingdom of God is, you know, kingdom of heaven is here, then shake it off, saying, saying that, that they, uh, they were defiled, because they were, they're unbelieving, you know, un, you know, they're not believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ, unbelieving, shake it off, they're still corrupt, they're still defiled. When we go out in the world, we're going out into a defiled world. When you go out those doors, that world you go out into is corrupt, is defiled, is wicked. It is foreign lands out there. We gotta recognize that. We ha regularly have to recognize we are going into enemy territory every time we leave our homes, every time we leave our church, we're going into enemy territory. And there's a part of us that has to recognize, okay, okay, I'm not carry, I can't carry that. I mean, from now on, every time you walk into the church, I want you to turn around, face the door, shake the you know, dust off your feet. No, kidding, kidding. Do it spiritually. You don't have to do it physically. But we need to recognize that the reality, here we are, these disciples, these apostles, they go into these places, they, they, they teach the truth that Jesus taught them, they work miracles to prove that their message is true, and then they're rejected. If, if the first apostles and the first missionary journey were rejected, we shouldn't be surprised when somebody doesn't want to hear what we have to say either, should we? Many of us are probably not working many miracles these days.
we must be faithful to share the gospel. In whatever way God has ordained for us to do it, whatever way God has given us to do it, whatever tools, whatever resources, whatever words, whatever relationships that God has given us, we need to find the way that God has created us to do it, and we need to be faithful to do it. And no, yeah, they're going to reject you. They rejected Jesus. They rejected his first apostles. You know, are, are you so amazing that they shouldn't reject you? Sorry, I know most of you. I should know all of you. I know you're not that amazing. It's also a sign by shaking the dust off to let them know these Jewish cities that they're unworthy of the blessings that God promised to Abraham and his descendants. That's harsh. They're to take it as a warning. God is not going to take rejection. I mean, at some point, there's going to be a consequence for rejecting the message of Jesus Christ. We all know that. You've been in this church long enough to know that that's reality. You reject the message of Jesus Christ, there is a consequence for that. It talks about it here in verse 15. Assuredly, I say to you, it'll be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of their wickedness. He's saying to them, it'll be more tolerable for those wicked cities than it will be for you. What's the difference? The difference is they know God. They've re they know his scriptures. The, you know, the, the cities that, that the disciples, the Jewish cities, the cities of Israel, all of them are, are well aware of the law of Moses and the things of God and, and what we refer to the Old Testament. They know those things. They, they, they have synagogues. They have, they have traveling rabbis. They have all these things going on. They know what God's word says. If you know all those things and then reject the gospel, it'll be more tolerable for, for wicked wrong Sodom and Gomorrah than it will be for you. You know, I think of our culture. We live in, we live in times when, well, you know, not so much today. We're living in a pretty unchurched time right now. But very few people can say they don't have some concept of who Jesus is. Through, through whatever means, even watching football games, you, you know, see John 3.16 on the, you know, the back of the football, you know, through the goalpost, you see John 3.16. You know, somebody's talking about Jesus somewhere. We will be judged, everyone will be judged by the amount of light that they received. If you were told anything about Jesus, about God, and you reject it, that's what will judge you in the day to come. Speaks of the day of judgment. One of the things we need to understand, this is not about a time of determining guilt or innocence. When the day of judgment comes, there's one truth that'll be true for everybody who, who gets to that place. It won't be for us. We, we, we've had our, our, our guilt dealt with. But everyone is guilty before God. Everyone who, everyone who has ever sinned is guilty before God. And the Bible says something very clearly about everyone. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. When it says all have sinned, who is that referring to? Everyone. Everyone. Is there, what about, what about the, what about the, you know, the, the, you know, that person in the darkest jungle that is, you know, the pygmies that have, you know, never heard about Jesus? Have they sinned? Yes. What about the Pope? Has he sinned? Yes. You know, what about Kevin in the back? Yes, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus said when he came, he, he says, I did, I did not con come to condemn, condemn the world. Why? It was already condemned. In John 3, 18, he says, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The reality is that all are, all are fallen, all are guilty, all are deserving of God's judgment, of, of final judgment, and that their only escape from that is believing in Jesus. 
that everyone can believe in Jesus. And if they believe in Jesus, then they are, they are not guilty. On the day of judgment, what's going to happen, the verdict will be read and the sentence passed. The guilt is already determined. There is no, there is no, there's no trial. There'll be no trial necessary, but God is patient. God is waiting, hoping that his goodness will lead them to repentance. And if they repent, then all of their guilt is washed away. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus then goes on to warn them, his disciples, his apostles, to be careful. Verse 16. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. He's saying, you know, you're going to go out, and it's not, it, it's not safe out there. It's not safe to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. And if legend is true, and we, we can't actually verify all of these, but the legend says that, you know, that all, but, all but one of the, of the original 12, well, well, Judas died by his own hand, but the other, 10 of the other 11 were, died as martyrs. According to legend, only John possibly lived to and, and die of an old age. It's not easy to share the gospel. Now, now chances are you're probably not going to get stoned or crucified if you share the gospel today, right? I mean, can we acknowledge that? The chances of you being, you know, taken out and, you know, put between two boards and sawn in half is probably pretty low. Would you, would you acknowledge that? But it's not without risk. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, but beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You'll be brought before governors and kings for my namesake or, or because, of, because of me you'll be brought before them as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Now brother will deliver a brother to death and a father his child and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death and you will be hated by all for my namesake or because of me. And he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For surely I say to you that you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes." Verse 16, he's telling them, okay, this, this, is not, this is not the pathway to riches and fame and, and ease of life. This is dangerous. It's, it may be hard, and it was hard for them, many of them. But he tells them to be wise and harmless. Now, wisdom we understand. The Bible is filled with descriptions of God's wisdom. It is God's wisdom and, and challenges us to use God's wisdom and, and tell us to avoid the opposite of God's wisdom, which is what? Foolishness. Don't be a fool. Be wise. God says over and over and over again, especially in the Proverbs. That's like a big place where you see it over and over and over again. The word harmless is interesting because it can also be translated as pure or innocent. And so this idea that when you bring in the gospel, be wise. Don't be, don't be, don't be foolish in how you bring the gospel. And to do it in such a way that, that, it, is, that it is harmless. You're not harming someone with it, that, that there's a purity and an innocence to how you do it. Now, I've met people who are in your face just, gospel evangelist bullies is a good word. They're just mean about it. And I don't get that. I don't get that. I don't see that in the way that Jesus presented himself. I don't see that in the way he presented the gospel. And I don't necessarily, I don't believe it. I don't believe that's how God should have it to be. Now, certain people may need a stronger presentation of the gospel than others. But for the most part, I think what he's saying here is, is important. Be wise. Be wise. But be innocent and pure. Harmless. The thing we, the thing we don't want to forget here. 
The gospel is the greatest gift that God has given to the world. The gospel message, the gospel of Christ Jesus, the fact that we are lost in our sin and that through Christ's sacrifice on the cross, we can be free, we can be forgiven, we can know the, the, the promise and the hope of heaven. That's a glorious and ultimately the greatest thing. It is a gift of immeasurable and eternal value. And it's been given to all of us. And if you're here today, you've, you've probably received that gift, right? We acknowledge that, that, that's, that as a believer, you have received the immeasurable, meaning it's so great that you cannot put a value to it. And, and it's an eternal gift. Now, all of us have gotten gifts, most of them are not of immeasurable value, and most of them are not eternal. They don't last. I know as a, as a, for my, personally, I rejected that gift for a long time. But now, I can't imagine why anyone would reject it. It makes no sense to me why somebody would reject it. But I was that person that rejected it for so long. I needed it. I didn't recognize that for a long time. They need it. Everybody you encounter in this world needs the gospel. Every single person. If they don't already have that gift, they need it. They may not know it, may not appreciate it, may they, they may not desire it, but they need it. Something keeps most Christians from sharing the gospel. Fear pride, or supposed inadequacies. I, I don't know enough to share the gospel. The men that Jesus called to go out and preach the gospel, they weren't theologians. They weren't even super mature in their faith. What, are they, what were they? They're men who had seen Jesus do these amazing things. They had a testimony of what Jesus, they knew. They knew the basics. And they'd seen all these things that God, now I, I believe God also gave them a supernatural gifting to preach and to share the gospel as well. And, and God still does that with some people today. But they didn't know everything. And it's possible that some of them had the same reservations that we might have when we're sharing the gospel. Verse 24 a disciple is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? Therefore, do not fear them. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Beelzebub it was a pagan god, lowercase g, god. And he was either the god of the flies or the god of dung. Now, I don't even want to imagine how you worship a god of dung. We're also going to see a little bit later, a couple of chapters, that, that this false god is associated with Satan. And we'll deal with that once we get to chapter 12. What he's saying here is, is don't be afraid of what other people think or say. All you need to know is what did God say? What did God say? What did God tell you? Don't worry about them. Yeah, they're going to call you names. If you're a believer today and you are bold in your faith, somebody's going to call you names. Right? Do we understand that? Have we seen that? You're going to be called a bigot. You're going to be called a hater. You're going to be called, uh, gosh, all sorts of ugly names. I've always been one of those guys, people. I know me well enough to know when you call me a name, I can look at myself and say, but wait, that's not true. And you know what I do with those names? Nothing. You know, you can call me a bigot, but I am not a bigot. And so if you call me a bigot and I'm not a bigot, then 
okay, then, then, your, then your little thing means absolutely nothing to me. Don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of what other people are going to say, what they're going to think. Oh, what if they cancel me? Well, God is bigger, bigger than their cancellation. I promise you that. Trust God. Do what God said. Don't be afraid of what others might think of you, what they might say about you, or what they might do. He's saying, he's saying God knows all of those things. He knows what they're going to say. He knew what they were going to say before he told you to go talk to them. He knew what they were going to do before he said, go do that. He knew what that was. He knew how they were going to respond because he knows everything in advance. So when he says, go do that, and he tells you to go do it, and you go do it, and then something, something weird or bad or ugly happens after that, God knew that was coming. Okay, then he's going to tell you what to do with it once you get there, right? If he told me to go and something happens and, I, and this bad thing happens, you know, you, know, the, you, know, you, know, we, you know, there's a possibility within this state in particular, there's going to be a point where I can't preach everything that God's word says. Well, the government's going to say that. And I'm going to probably still do it anyway. But there may be a consequence to that. Am I afraid of that? Absolutely not. If I, get, if I get to Romans 1, which should become, might, might be coming up in the, in the not too distant, you know, uh, it, depending on how you describe distant, uh, it, it may come, you know, I was thinking maybe Romans is next. Um, if that's the fact, if I get to Romans 1 and I preach Romans 1, I treat, treat it faithfully, hey, somebody's going to object to that. Somebody's going to call me a bigot. They're going to call me a hater. They're going to call me all sorts of things. They're going to cancel me off of, you know, who knows or who cares what. I'm not worried about that. I'm, all I'm concerned about is, is can I be faithful to God and can I be faithful to you? That's what I care about. I want to be faithful to God first and I want to be faithful to you second. God will deal with them. God will deal with all that stuff. He'll deal with the consequences. There's consequences coming. Okay, he'll deal with those. Doesn't mean he's going to save me from them, but he will save me through them. And I believe that and I trust him for that. Verse 28. Oh, 27. Let's read, actually read 20. We don't want to skip verses, right? Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. Whatever you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will? But the very head, hairs on your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. As Jesus sends out his disciples, he sent them into hostile territory. He sent them out to, to the Jewish people who, are, who have historically been hostile to the gospel message because one of the things that the gospel message is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, equal to God. And to a Jewish mind, that, that, they're, they, 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 can't, they can't comprehend that. And often they would respond, with great hostility. I mean, the whole, the whole count of Saul of Tarsus. Saul, when he originally you know, comes onto the scene, he's persecuting the way Christians who are claiming that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And, and that was their response. He was hunting them down. He was, he was there as they were being stoned. He was throwing them into jail. That was the world Jesus is sending his disciples into. And he's saying, don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid of those who can harm the body. They can't touch your soul. More value than anything in the universe is your soul. And they can't touch it. Don't be afraid of those who, who can hurt the soul. But you ought to be afraid of him who can harm the soul. Who is that? God. Now, we don't have to be afraid of it because we are one of his kids, but we ought to have a great reverential awe of him who can. Don't be afraid. Share Jesus. You know, as Jesus was sending out the 12, the, the possibility of being martyred was high. You know, as we, as we you get into the early pages of the book of Acts, you know, 
Stephen preaches the gospel and does it with great power and authority. What do they do? Oh, thank you. No. They drag him out of the town and pile rocks on top of him until he's dead. We have nothing to fear from man or the governments of men. Yeah, they may oppose us. They may come against us. They may try to harm us in some way, but we're not to be afraid of that. If anything, we, it, ought to, it ought to just cause us to be that much more determined to teach and preach the truth of God and his word as long as we possibly can and as faithfully as we possibly can. How well does God know you? He knows you so well that he knows how many hairs are on your head, even John's head. He knows every hair. It, 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 you know, there's, there's different opinions about what it means that the hairs are numbered, that, that just those the quantity of them, or that each one is literally numbered, like with a, with a heavenly barcode. So if he calls it, oh, there goes number 47,382. He knows every one. If he knows every hair on your head and he cares about even that, it, it, it ought to just fill your heart with awe and wonder at how much he cares for you. That, that, that I, and this is the thing, fear is a natural thing, right? Do we acknowledge that? Fear is natural. You know, and, and, and that's the problem with it, by the way. But it's natural. That when we, something comes against us, something threatens us, fear is a natural response to it. But what God is looking for is that we counter fear with trust. That, that while this fear is natural, this threat comes to me, and there is, a, there is a reality that this threat can cause me harm in some way, either physically or emotionally, you know, financially or whatever, whatever it might be. And there's lots of those things that are kind of stir, stimulating this right now, this, this idea of fear. But there's this, all of the other thing too. There is God who knows us so intimately and so completely, so fully, that if we would put our trust in him, that we can, that we can literally, Literally override fear. That we can live without fear. That we can translate our fear into trust and saying, okay, God, that is real. That thing that, 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 that stimulates the fear within me is real. And there is a real danger. You know, Jesus isn't downplaying the dangers here, is he? He's saying, hey, hey, yeah, they, can, they could kill your body. That's not downplaying the danger. But don't worry about them. Don't fear them. Don't be afraid of that. Brothers and sisters, there are lots of things in our world that want us to be afraid, can make us afraid. There's finances, there's economy, there's weather, there's Hurricane Hillary. You know, there's all these things that want to stimulate us to, you know, to, to create fear within us. And we have to say, we have to ask ourselves the question, do I trust God more than my fear? Because you're going to trust one or the other. You're going to trust God or you're going to trust your fear. Well, wait a minute, you trust my fear. Yeah, if you allow fear to dominate you, that's where your trust is. Your trust is in your fear. Or what you think your fear is missing or, or whatever it might be. And God says, don't trust in that. Trust in me. What can God do? Well, everything. About what? Everything. When? Every time. Trust him. Don't fear. Do you trust God enough to go where he sends you and do what he tells you, regardless of what the possible dangers are, what the possible consequences are? Do you trust him enough? Now, not everyone is called to minister like the apostles here. They were called to minister to their community in a very specific way for a very specific time. But God has called all of us to do something for him. There's no believer that, he's, that he created that does not have a purpose. And a purpose beyond, you know, 
being a husband or a father, and those are all good things. You should do that. Wives and mothers and co-workers and whatever your thing might be. There's more. There's always more. Last week, we, call, we read that Jesus calls us all to pray to God the Father to send out laborers into the harvest field. The har- the, I, mean, I mean, we're living in a time. There are more unbelievers in the world today than have ever lived in human history. There, the harvest field is huge ripe. Kelly spent eight hours yesterday, I don't know, four or five, six hours yesterday, you know, pruning and harvesting grapes, and she got through about a third of them. The, the harvest is ripe. And the reality is, is that's the true in, the, in, the, in the, the world out there, too. It's ripe. We need laborers. And we, as God's people, ought to be praying that God would send out laborers. We need to be praying faithfully, God, raise up laborers to go out there and harvest the field. We ought to be praying for the lost by name as often as we can. And if God gives you the opportunity to speak to somebody who's far from God, ask God to give you just the right words to draw them a little bit closer to Jesus. Maybe not all the way. Maybe he won't let you give them all the way, but maybe you can bring them a little bit closer. Just say something that communicates the love, the grace, the power, the the, the amazing reality of who God is and what he's done in your life. And all of us ought to repent of any fear or doubt or pride that might stand in the way of sharing the truth of Jesus Christ with someone around us. It doesn't hurt to be prepared to talk to people about Jesus, but you don't have to be. I always tell people, I I, I just don't know what to say. Well, just tell them what Jesus did for you. Just say something about Jesus. You don't have to have, you know, the Romans road memorized to, to share Jesus with somebody. Jesus did something in your life. Tell them. Well, but what if they ask me questions I don't know? Well, I don't know. That people ask me questions I don't know. And I've been studying the Bible for, you know, a minute and a half. I don't know the answer to that. You know what? But I'm going to try to find out for you. It's okay to not have all the answers because no one has all the answers except God himself. One of the greatest tools for evangelism that you can use is your testimony. Just tell people. Tell people your story. They can't argue with it. They can't say it's not true. And the second thing you can do is love God with your whole heart. Love God with every bit of yourself. There's something powerful when you give all of yourself to God, and you love him with every bit of yourself, somehow that radiates out from you into the lives of others. And the third thing, love your church. Love your church. There's something powerful in that as well. As God draws us together, that we might draw strength from one another as we get ready to go back out into the world. That's going to drain the spiritual life out of us every single week. Love your church. Get connected to it. Get engaged, as I shared with the men yesterday morning at the men's breakfast. If you missed it, go online and watch it. Ladies, you can watch it too. I didn't, I didn't use any curse words at all, I promise. I never do. The fields are ripe for harvest. There, is, there are so many people that need to hear about Jesus. As I said, there are more lost people on earth today than ever have existed in human history. They all need to hear about Jesus. Pray. Ask God to send out more laborers. Pray. Ask God how you can help to send out more laborers and whatever that might be. Ask God how you might encourage those who are out there in the, la- in the harvest field. Now, I'm thinking of Pastor Brandon and his family. He's over there in Indonesia ministering to the lost in Indonesia. How can we minister to him? 
Well, we can start by praying for him. That, that's a good beginning, but there's probably other things we can do as well. Pray. Ask God to give you a heart for the lost. I don't think enough of us do that. God, change my heart. Help me to feel for the lost the way you feel. Pray. Ask God to deal with anything that's in you that is standing in the way of you sharing the gospel with somebody. If there's anything, fear, pride, doubt, supposed ignorance of the gospel, any of that stuff, pray. Ask God to take all that away because there should be nothing. There's nothing between you and that person except those things in you that don't belong there. God has called us to love the lost, to love them the way he does. And if we do that, if we truly love them, then God is going to do work in us. Now, he may. He may send us out. He might. He might not. But you know what? If you're loving Jesus and you're asking God to change your heart and he does change your heart, you know what's going to, you know what's going to happen in you? You're going to long to get out there. When God says, I want you to go, you're going to say, here I am, Lord, send me. I'm ready. Just pray. Ask God to do your work, and he will. Speaking of that, let's pray now. Heavenly Father, we praise you for this morning and this opportunity to gather together as your people. And Lord, we just ask, Lord God, as we've talked about this idea of, of, of loving the lost, I pray, Lord, that you would even now start to do that work inside of us, that we would love those who are far from you in such a way that they would be drawn near to you and that they would, they would, they, they would sense that growing need for something in their lives that only you can give them and that when we come, that they are ready to receive. And Lord, we also recognize that there are many, 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 many of the people that, we're in a, that we might have an opportunity to talk to have no desire and, that, and are not ready. And they will reject the message. Lord, let us have, let us have hearts that are, that while we were, that it'll, it'll grieve our heart they reject it, but we won't take that as a rejection of us. That, that we are faithful to do our part. We are faithful to share. And then once we've shared, the responsibility is on them. And if they reject it, they're rejecting you, not us. And I pray, Lord God, that we would, we would learn to be okay with that. Not okay with the fact that they rejected it, but okay that that's just one of the realities of sharing the gospel. If, if people rejected you, Jesus... Then, then we shouldn't be surprised that they reject us. If they rejected the apostles, then, then, they, then we shouldn't be surprised that they reject us. But does not, that does not um, eliminate the, the responsibility that we have to take that gospel out. So I pray, Lord, give us the courage, give us the boldness, drive out the fear and the doubt and the insecurities and all those things that might keep us from it and help us, Lord, to be faithful to share with everyone that we come in contact with. And I pray, Lord, for the lost. I pray, Lord, that, that you would send out harvesters that you would help us to send out harvesters, that you, would, that you would help us to send out laborers into your field, that we would, that we would be busy about the work of, of raising up and sending out laborers. And I pray, Lord, for all of us, Lord God, that we would uh, love you more, that we would love you with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, that we would love the lost, that we would love your church, and that we would just keep at it until such time as you come to take us home. We praise you. We thank you. We lift this day up to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us as we learn more about our Savior King and his kingdom in the Gospel of Matthew. It is our hope that these messages will help you grow in your faith. If you have any questions or there is anything we can do to help you with that, please do not hesitate to connect with us. Go to calvaryfv.com connect to find all the ways that you can connect with us. As Christians, we are all connected in Christ. One of the ways we would like to engage with you is in the area of prayer. Please let us know how we can be praying for you. Send us an email to prayer at calvaryfv.com or text the word PRAY to 
5396. If this material has been useful to you, please share it with someone. Also, please pray that God would use these messages to help others find hope in Jesus Christ. You can also partner with us financially by going to calvaryfv.com give or text the word give to 951-419-5396. Until next time, go be radical with Jesus. Thank you.